So if I unmute. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. I am your host, Nicole Gallucci. I'm a postdoc with the CosmoQuest project. Uh, my co-host, Georgia, is doing a two-week-long teacher professional development workshop, so she won't be joining us this week, unfortunately. So yay, Georgia. Have fun. Uh, I am joined by Robert Sparks today. Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Nicole? Good. How are you? Good. And we are going to talk a bit about a Galileo scope and, and optics activities you could do with the Galileo scope. And I have a trusty Galileo scope, not mine, one of the resource center ones. Uh, mine, mine is with a pile of telescopes <laughs> at home. Um, for all of you guys watching, I see a bunch of hellos in the Q&A. So hi, Douglas. Michael, you win first comment. Uh, <laughs> hi, Nancy. And good evening over Jeremy to Guido. Uh, if you are watching this anywhere on Google Plus or YouTube or somewhere where it's embedded, you can click to where it says join the conversation and that will take you to the Q&A app and so we'll be watching the comments there. Uh, hello Brandon as well, so yay, thanks for coming everybody. Um, so yeah, feel free to send in any comments or questions throughout the show and we will try and get to them through the Q&A app. So, Robert, how are you? Good. How how is life in uh, in Arizona? Hot and clear. No no not a cloud in the sky for the last week, which has been fun. Wow. But uh, the monsoons will start hopefully soon to cool us down a little bit. Right right. And the telescopes pretty much um, do a lot of maintenance during monsoon season, right? Mon that is monsoon, correct. Monsoon season for those of you who are actually in Asia and get. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not quite the same. Technically, it's not a monsoon in terms of the same weather patterns, but it's commonly called the monsoon here. Yeah. July 15th, I believe, is the date they shut down for maintenance till about September 1st. Oh, wow. Okay. Still a couple weeks for that, but usually the monsoons, the rains will start a week or so before shutdown, so it gets dicey toward the end there. Yeah, yeah, it just rains constantly, which is nice. I mean, you need it. <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah. Cool. So I wanted to talk some about um, the Galileo Scope Optics Activity Guide, and I can put a link to that in the, um, I think, it, I, I mean, I probably have it saved somewhere in my browser, but I just Google Galileo Scope Optics Guide, and it comes up um, from the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. And uh, I will share a link in the comments as well uh, on the event pages. Yes, I know there are two event pages. It's very confusing. Welcome to my life. There we go. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the development of this this optics guide? Yeah, well, the, the, to start the optics guide, we should actually take a step back before the Galileo scope even existed because mm -hmm. the, uh, um, it was based on previous work, obviously. Um, and uh, when I got here, when I first came to NOAO in 2005, uh, the big grant we were working on at the time was hands-on optics, and I was hired specifically to work a lot on that grant, and this was, that was a four-year grant from the National Science Foundation to develop optics education materials for middle school, basically. We worked with uh, the MESA programs, and that stands for Math, Engineering, and Science Achievement in several states, that which included Arizona, I think it's, that's eight states, Arizona, um, California, Oregon, Washington, New Mexico, Utah, and Maryland. Mm -hmm. I don't know how Maryland got in there. They're sort of the oddball geographically, but <laughs> Maryland was one of the eight states, and so we developed that, and we'd work with the MESA programs and do teacher workshops each year in those states on these modules we developed. And, of course, uh, one of them was on what called Magnificent Magnifications, which was our third module, um, which dealt with lenses and telescope optics. And we used those old Project Star telescopes. I don't know if you remember those things or not. I don't think so. You're a young one. You might not remember Project Star telescopes. They're, they're these cardboard telescopes that had, that had a red cap on the end. They'd have like a plastic um, objective and a little uh, single plastic uh, eyepiece. They okay. gave about, I think they gave 20 magnification or so for a 50 millimeter telescope, and there was so much chromatic aberration that had a field stop on it to try and reduce chromatic aberration. <laughs> they, they were they were okay for you know educational use, but. Uh, uh, a lot of frustrating things about them for night use, obviously. Right. Um, you know, you couldn't mount them on a tripod. The chromatic aberration was ridiculous. The field of view was so small, you could, you know, you'd be hard to find the moon. I can't remember what the field of view was, but I'm pretty sure it was significantly less than half a degree, so you wouldn't have been able to fit the full moon in there at one time. Yeah. They were developed back, you know, 
uh, I want to say in the 1980s and had been around. They, they, you can still buy them online. So if you search Project Star Telescopes, you can see them. These little red. The, the, the folks are just their two cardboard tubes, one slightly larger, one slightly smaller. You slide in and out. We might but, have a set of those in the Resource Center. Yeah, yeah. They were very popular for a long time. So like I said, they're still available to us. Project Star got, uh, was it, the, the learning technologies got bought out by a company in Florida called Science First, and I think Science First still sells them. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, when the International Year of Astronomy came around, 2009, that's when the uh, Galileo scope started being developed by NOAO, uh, Photonics Engineering, uh, the AAS, Rick Feinberg, uh, Doug Arian, and uh, Steve Pompey, and all the, a lot, bunch of other people working on the Galileo scope, and that's when we started taking the stuff we'd worked on for the... Um, Hands-on optics program and adapting some of it to meet with the got to work with the Galileo scope and a lot of the t activities did transfer right over. So, okay. but there of course were definitely some we don't longer use the Project Star telescopes. There were definitely some things we wanted to um, modify for that. So yeah, here's playing. yeah, the Galileo scope is a, definitely a big improvement of the Project Star telescope. This is actually a useful instrument for nighttime observing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've actually gotten pictures of the rings of Saturn through that thing with, and there's some great moon pictures as well. So oh, I need, nice. need to get out and do some more, uh, do some more uh, photography with it. With what but, kind of camera? Uh, just to, I was using a really, you know, Kodak, you know, instant, you know, Kodak digital camera. Just you know, put it up to the eyepiece and turn off the flash and click basically. Oh. Now I did cheat a little bit because I put the uh, Galileo scope on a tripod and the camera on a second tripod to hold it steady at the eyepiece. That makes sense. Yeah. So, but once you do that, it's actually not that difficult. And there was another, and uh, I had a, a little web-based camera for my telescope. I think it's, a, I got it like in 2002 or 2003. I think it's called an AstroCam. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually a gift for helping someone out. It's just basically a little, the guts, someone took the guts of a web camera this company did many years ago and put it inside a one and a quarter inch eyepiece barrel. So you just slide it right into the end of a tele, any telescope. Basically, it takes a one and a quarter inch eyepiece and uh, photograph through that. So that's pretty a uh, neat, neat little device that they came up with, which unfortunately the software is no longer available for Mac, so I can't use that. So oh. I've been able to get to work with Mac recently. <laughs> <That's sad. And coughs> so yeah, so we've done a couple of episodes about the Galileo scope specifically. You can get it at galileoscope.org, I think. Yep. Is the proper tag yeah. um, at the end. Um, you can get a case of six. Six for, for 150 is still the going rate. Yep. 150. Okay. Okay. Plus um, shipping. We have several, yeah, so we, we manage, we, we tend to buy them in bulk here because we do them for student camps and, and teacher workshops as well, so that's really nice to buy them in bulk. Uh, but I have one that I actually bought in 2009 in the year of astronomy uh, that I still have at home in my pile of telescopes. Um, well, I, I, just, I just buy, for, for myself personally, about every, every year or so, I buy a case for myself and that way I have them at my house and whenever, you know, niece or nephew has a birthday or something or you know, some neighbor's kid has a birthday or someone needs a gift for a raffle, it's just like, here, have a Galileo scope. So. That's awesome. That's actually a really good idea. <laughs> you just have to keep track of who you give them to, so don't give them twice, you know. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got some nieces and nephews that haven't gotten telescopes yeah. yet. I think I can start doing that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, what I love about this, so we just did um, a backyard astronomer camp here um, with some students. So I'm at SIU in Edwardsville. We went east a bit to a town of Mascuda and did a, um, a workshop with students. I talked about some of the activities on this show because my, my guests unfortunately canceled at the last minute because internet is horrible sometimes. Um, and uh, I to talked a little bit about some of the activities that we did. So I am actually... Uh, while we're talking about this, I'm going to take this galoscope back apart, <laughs> just like I did in the workshop, so I can show the kids how it comes together. Um, and me having an instrumentation background, I love that you get to build this telescope um, and kind of see how everything lines up and see how everything works. And I think that's kind of the the progression of activities in the the optics guide as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, do you want to build the telescope or show them that first, and then we talk about the guide, or do you want to? Um, you well, why don't you maybe talk a little bit? I'm going to start pulling it apart. Okay. Well, Could the guide you... we sort of go through, um, we start with, very, you know, uh, we take an acrylic block. Let's see if I have the block here. Okay, here we go. Where'd my laser go? Hi, here we go. We, we just do stuff with basic, well, you know, there's a variety of ways to show how light bends when it goes through from air to other substances. And we have a, in the kit, we actually, well, let me, let me back up a second here. This is actually one of the items we used in the hands-on optics kit, and for the hands-on optics kit, we uh, tried to find low-cost items we could use 
to make for the teachers. And these acrylic blocks, we get them from a company online for about three bucks a piece. You know, they cut them to cut the custom shape for us and everything. So they're very, very cheap and inexpensive. And uh, uh, you can do this experiment a lot of ways, but for, you know, using um, fish tanks and stuff. But this is much more portable and cheaper and easier to do. And of course, a laser, and we'll take the laser and. Oops, where's there? We go. Yay. Get it, get it in the webcam field of view. We'll just sort of show them. I don't think you'll be able to see it on the camera, but uh, you know, sort of show them what happens when light goes through the block this way, and you know, sort of tilt it so you can see how light changes the path when it goes from one surface to one substance to another. You know, it goes from pla air to plastic or plastic to air. And we do a lot of talking about how you know light changes speed and it slows down and bends. You know, depending on the age level, of course. You, Depends right. on whether you're going to get into whether it bends toward the normal or not. But most students at least get the idea that you know things slow down when they go to plastic, even fairly young. Yeah, so it makes yeah. sense. Denser material, light slows down. Okay, it's not really physical density, but they call it optical density, which is you know not necessarily 100% related, but kind of is. Right. <laughs> kind of, but not sorta. Kind of, sorta, but not really. Right. Kind of, sorta, maybe. <laughs> kind of, sorta, a little. So once we talk for a while about how light goes when it um. How light behaves when it goes from air to plastic, and this is just a flat surface. We'll take out a nice big lens here. We got these nice big lenses, and this, these, if, you ever, if you ever if you ever need cheap educational optics, there's a company on the web called Surplus Shed. Surplus, uh, surplus Shed. Dot com. Okay. And they have a, a variety of educational. They have an educational optics session section, which is all. Very inexpensive uh, material. This, yeah, this is the big lens. You have the small one. I have the little big one. Yeah, the lens. <laughs> yeah. But this is a big, bigger lens. I think it's a 100 millimeter lens. It's nice. a 20 centimeter focal length. They sell it for about three bucks, so it's fairly inexpensive. And we'll take that and we'll take three lasers. I love the way that th these are the lasers we used originally for hands on optics, and I love them because Ooh. they're actually laser levels. Let's see if I have one that's actually a. Uh, right now they're sort of rubber banded together. There's three of them here. Yeah. But they're very nice because they have a switch that, let's see, get up to the camera here. They have a switch so you can, they'll stay on without you touching it. They have little legs so you can set them on the ground without, let's see, little legs. Oh, there's legs. <laughs> Things are reversed on the camera. It's confusing me. Yes, yes. <laughs> legs so you can set down without them um, falling over. And they're just great. And plus, they're actually bigger than like laser pointers. So they're less likely for students to walk out with the room with them. That's so, good. Where did so, you get those? Uh, they, they, unfortunately, they're not made anymore. They came from Harbor Freight. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, but that, 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 they have stores all over the country, but we got them from Harbor Freight, and they're fairly cheap. They're like six, seven bucks a piece, so they're fair, you know, fairly, fairly, fairly inexpensive, but really nice in a lot of ways for what we were using them for. Nice. So we started taking three lasers and then you know, shine them through the big lens and uh, point them at a screen. Mm -hmm. and for the screens, we use these little vellum guys. We just yeah. have a little piece of vellum on here. And the, the nice thing about vellum is if you shine a laser on it, you can see it from both sides. Let's see if I can get it up here so you can yeah, see that. Yeah. The laser spot. But also if you're on this side, so you can sort of do theater in the round. So no matter which side a student is standing on, they can see what's going on. Right. So these semi-transparent material, some semi translucent material, I guess you'd call it. Would um like uh, tissue paper work for that as well? Tissue paper works, yeah. Okay. But then, you know, again, this is a the frame here with this this holds it nice and steady though, and you actually um Take your styrofoam cup and cut a little mm -hmm. slit in it, and they'll hold it up very nicely for you. So it'll hold it nicely, just like we do for the lenses, which we'll get to in a minute here. Yeah, yeah. But this is very nice because it's like it's a very nice. And these, it's cheap. The vellum's cheap. The frame we get cut, custom cut to size. They're about you know forty cents a piece, so they're mm -hmm. they're not expensive. And I have an uh, undergraduate students who glue them together for me, so I don't have to worry about that. So <laughs> <clears throat> always nice to have a uh, expendable labor, right? <laughs> Sorry, undergrads. We've been there. It's okay. Yeah. Then we just sort of take this and we sort of look at what happens when light passes through here. You know, do, do you have three laser beams, and we say, well, okay, what's laser beam A, B, C? Which laser produces which spot? And hopefully, they'll, you know, sometimes they'll get to the point where we can see the light beams crossing. And if you want, to, you can actually take the uh, little water or chalk dust or something and actually watch the beams of the laser cross. But we always show them this before we uh, let them see the beams. Although it's always we seeing the beams is a lot of fun. Fog machine. Um, yeah, fog we... machines work well too. <laughs> or dry ice, you know, dry ice giving it off its steam. That always works well we, too. We did, have, we did have a situation where we had to clear the room at one point because we went a little overboard during a laser <laughs> bounce ex no, laser bouncing challenge. But uh -huh. fun. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I do a lot of theater, and many years ago I did uh, Damn Yankees, and we actually had to evacuate the theater because our fog machine set off the light of smoke alarm. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, the fire department came and everything because the alarms wired straight to the fire department. So yeah, 
Whoops. <laughs> yeah, whoops, easy on that fog machine, so I know how that goes. I had to evacuate 300 people because of it, too. So <laughs> We only really had a handful of students. We were just like, okay, everybody go play outside for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Let's play asteroid accretion tag. <laughs> Then after that, we actually go on and play with the lenses for a while. We mm -hmm. play with lenses a lot. We have these, again, surplus shed lenses. These are nice little lenses. They cost about a buck a piece. Nice. So they, they're, they're, we have two. We actually give them two different lenses. One which is we call it the thin lens because look at the edge; it's much thinner. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other one, which I'm just getting out here, is called the thick lens because if you look at it from the edge, you can see it. Hopefully, I think that shows up there in the camera. They're different shapes. Yes. Yeah. yeah One's much that. thicker than the other. We start asking students to find the focal length, and typically for younger students, we just use the very distant object. Because mm -hmm. if you use a distant object, and distant means you know, many multiples of the focal length away, you know, the focal length is approximately equal to where the image forms, so you don't have to do any complicated math. Of course, for older students, you can use the thin lens formula if you really want to, and use a close object to make them do the thin lens formula. But young students, you can actually get the focal length pretty close just by looking at a very distant object. And for very distant objects, if you don't have a window available, we use neon lights. So you have mm -hmm. a whole bunch of these big neon lights. I'm not going to take it out here, just but they buy these online for about 15, 20 bucks, and they're big. Basically, this one's uh, it's this one. I'm not going to turn it off. This is a big butterfly light. I remember using that one at ASP. You, yeah, you, oh, we, we broke one there, didn't we? Yes, we did. Not it. I was in the back of the room. <laughs> yeah, you, I'm glad, yeah, you're not. It wasn't you. <laughs> I'm claiming not it. <laughs> So we, we can project the images on the screen and find you know, which, which lens has a bigger, longer focal length, which lens has a shorter focal length. They're made of the same material, so it's just dependent strictly on the shape of the lens for these guys. Um, which one makes a bigger, is the image right side up or upside down? You can definitely see the upside down image. Uh, which lens gives a brighter image? One lens gives a brighter image. Which lens gives, produces a larger image, smaller image? There's a lot of experiments you can do with these lenses here to start looking at how these lenses behave. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we sort of look at the eyepiece part of the telescope. So that, you know, that sort of simulates the objective. You form the image with a single lens. So you sort of move on. We don't tell the students that the objective, objective of a telescope, and we don't tell them the next step is looking at the eyepiece of a telescope. So the next step, we sort of take these lenses and turn them around and start putting them closer than a focal length, look at mm -hmm. very small print, pennies, that sort of thing, and use them as magnifying glasses and let students explore the magnifying properties of these lenses. Um, you know, where's the flip point? If you're very close to an object, it's magnified, but if you get farther away you look, and you look through the lens, the image flips over and is upside down. So sort of hopefully they'll get that the flip point happens roughly near the focal point and ask them which one's a better magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. then that, so we, again, we haven't said anything about telescopes yet, but then we start saying, okay, now let's put these combined two lenses, you know, combine two lenses, to put one by your eye, one out here, and see if you can make a telescope. And of course, your idea, the goal is to make a, an image that is magnified. Put them backwards, the image is smaller. But we don't tell them which lens is objective, which one's the eyepiece yet at this right, point. Figure that out. And then we, of course, try to get the idea across that, you know, we also have measured the uh, distance between the uh, two lenses when they mm -hmm. get a good image. And so say, is there, is there a relationship between the distance between those lenses and their focal lengths? Which, for a telescope, of course, you simply add them. So that's fairly simple, even for relatively low level math students to add two numbers together. Um, that was a nice little thing there. And then, of course, we can do one more step. We try and really, you know, really figure out how do you get across the idea that the objective forms an image and the eyepiece is your magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is we actually take our vellum, go back to our vellum screen. And we'll have them set up the lenses with the styrofoam cups, which you had a minute ago. I think so I have some. They're actually right. from the yeah. workshop or pre cut by the students. <laughs> yep, I, have, I have cups in the back of my room here. You know, it's very easy. If you want to do a nice job cutting, you can, but if not, you just sort of push the lens in there and make a little slit. I think we just, we just gave the them to let them go to town. Yeah. <laughs> they can actually hold the lenses, put the screen in between them, and they can see that the first lens forms an image on the screen. Right. The second lens goes on the other side of the screen, again, one focal length away, and that they look through it and they can see it magnified. And of course, when they remove the screen, they see pretty much the same thing. So it's just a way of letting them actually see the physical image formation without that, you know, all you need is something to reflect off and you get that image formation to actually see the image is really there, move right. the screen, the image is still there, they just can't see it because there's nothing for it to reflect off of. So we try and get through that and we of course will go through, depending on the age, we'll go through the magnification formula, focal length of objective divided by focal length of the eyepiece. And as a photographer, one of my favorite little things I always like doing at the end is going back to this first lens. Mm -hmm. We have the large lens, 
has a big diameter and the smaller diameter lens, they have the same focal length. Right. It's always interesting to ask students, you know, what if I take both these lenses and project the same image, how will they be the same or different? You know, what properties will be the same, what will be different between these two lenses? And then, of course, if you want to get to, I, I'm into photography, so I, with older students especially, like high school students, I will get into the uh, uh, focal ratios of lenses. Mm -hmm. Because what, what lens is fast, what difference between a fast lens and a slow lens. Right. So I'm really into photography, so I like doing that with the older students in particular. And photography students, you always get one or two students who are really into photography and say, oh, so that's what those numbers mean, <laughs> which is always a lot of fun. Cool. Then we go on to building the Galileo scope, right. which, of course, you have right there. Yes, I have it in pieces. Um, so we didn't, so we um, used some of the, so we have, we don't have the same lens kit, which it's really nice lens kit, uh, but we, we kind of went through our optic stuff and pulled out lenses to use for that. Um, so I had slightly different focal lengths, but I was able to figure it out from the average of the students. <laughs> Um, and instead of those neon lights, because we didn't have one of those on hand, I don't know why we have this, but there's a big cork board. I wish I'd, I'd taken a picture of it with uh, red Christmas lights that make big arrows. It was just looped back and forth, making a big arrow. So we have this big <laughs> lit up arrow, actually kind of pink, pink arrow. Um, so with just Christmas lights, you can you can kind of make a shape. I've, I've done that before too. One time, I told you about project uh, the hands-on optics project. We had to do workshops all over the country, and it. One of the workshops, our neon light got broken in shipment. Oh, no. So, of course, what we do, we run to the store and grab a string of those LED lights, that, like yep. you mentioned, Christmas-type lights, and just improvise with them. So we've, we've used those, too. Nice. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's for an optics demo, because when else do you have a big lit-up arrow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for, for science, at least. Uh, so, yeah, I have the Galileo scoping pieces, since um, this one came all together to... I'm going to make you guys slightly motion sick, so hang on there. <laughs> Um, so I've got it mostly in pieces now. I haven't completely taken the eyepiece apart because I the last thing I need is them rolling off my desk mm -hmm. and having to chase tiny lenses. But I've taken the eyepiece. Um, this is always uh, one of the hardest things to do with students because you've got to follow the instructions on which is the curved side, which is the flat side, trying not to get yeah. fingerprints on it. As and each, it each what you just showed are actually two lenses, not one. Yep. So there's actually four lenses there total, not two. Yeah, and that's I'm afraid to pull them together. all out and have them roll apart. Yeah, so there's two here, and then two here, and then this tiny little ring, which somehow everybody managed to miss when we were unpacking. <laughs> we had to go through the, the boxes that had already made their way to the garbage. <laughs> or actually, to the cycling. That, just, just so you know about that, that's actually just a field stop. Right, um, right. The Galileo scope has a field of view of one and a half degrees, specification wise. Right. But if you remove the field stop, the field of view is slightly larger, closer to two degrees. Right. But, and so it's actually an interesting experiment to remove that field stop and see how it changes the image. Okay. And if you do it, you'll notice that way at the edge of the field of view out there, stars are distinctly not round anymore. <laughs> so, so that, 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 that sort of shows, that sort of just cuts off that out, very outer part of the field of view where it gets, the image gets really ratty. Here we go. So, I can show but you the scope works just fine without it. The two lenses that pull apart here. Yeah. So. I think there's so I, I was teaching okay so we had we had uh, mostly middle school age kids so it was, okay so there's the convex and that's like the bubble <laughs> and the concave is like the spoon um, and having them them figure that out as we went along uh, I want to pull down some comments we're getting um, uh, Guido is talking about f uh, photography through the eyepiece of a telescope. Uh, the bigger your lens, the more difficult it gets. I was able to get do that with my small compact cameras and my little Newtonian, um, but it doesn't seem to work with my bigger bridge cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I'm not, I what, what? throw my I like uh, camera phone my uh, sorry brain. I throw my phone camera up against the eyepiece. Yeah. Uh, he says he has trouble photographing uh, through the eyepiece of a telescope. With a, with a bigger when there's a bigger lens, um, the smaller compact cameras are easier to use. Yeah, small compact cameras, the one I got my pictures of Saturn and stuff with, and they're very good. For cell phones, Orion makes this little adapter here, which goes over your eyepiece, then your cell phone goes in this oh, guy. Oh yeah, I just saw that. I was looking at tripods and it like so, advertised that. I love these guys. They're I think they're about 60, 70, 60 bucks a piece or so, but they, they they adjust. You can get them specifically for iPhones, but I got to the universal ones. So I have a Galaxy, and it works with the Galaxy S4. Okay. But it gets a little tight, so if you get if you have like a Galaxy Note, this probably wouldn't quite do the trick. But up to Galaxy S4, 
S5, it works okay. Yeah, phone's bigger than my hand. I yeah. draw the limit. <laughs> <laughs> I like my big phone, but they're getting a bit large. And I have the Steady Picks also, which is um a similar device except it works for digital cameras. Okay. It has this goes up. Let's see. This guy goes over the one and a quarter inch eyepiece holder, and your camera get, uh, mounts on this little quarter twenty nut here. Okay. And, and so they're, they're getting Ryan sells things. It's a lot of company sells these things. I think these are a little cheaper. I think this one's about thirty dollars. Okay. So I think this one wasn't quite as much. It also comes with two uh, eyepiece things. So if you have two inch eyepieces, it comes with a second guy you can replace and use a two inch eyepiece as well. Nice. Unfortunately, I have tried this one with the Galileo scope. And the Galileo scope, because it's that thick plastic, this does not really fit over the Galileo scope tube that well. So I have tried this one, but it really doesn't fit the Galileo scope well. Gotcha. Uh, we have, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, Tom Nathy, I'm not going to display this comment because I think it'll make it go away for everybody, but if you're using the Q&A app, there is a link uh, to Harbor Freight where he found a 2-in-1 magnetic torpedo laser level. Ooh. <laughs> it's great shit. I didn't, read the, I didn't actually read the title before showing it, so apparently. Does this look similar to what you're using? Yep, that's very similar. Okay. A little more expensive, but similar, yes, very similar. Gotcha. Cool. So if you're looking to do that 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 laser demo bit, <laughs> I have. I think I think that uh, similar to this, isn't it? Oh, nice. Yeah, it's got the three axes. Yep. Uh, so is that, is it, uh, there's a good chance I have. If there's a good chance I've tried to at le least looked at it or seen it in my life because we've had to find new sources for lasers over the years and right. test new models. And actually, the, the those orange ones I showed off earlier, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just mention one of the other. The main reason we liked that one is it passed the drop test. <laughs> Literally, when we were making the hands-on optics kits originally, we bought probably about 12 or 15, 12 to 15 different types of lasers and just started dropping them on cement floors and seeing which one survived the best. Oh my God! Because we were thinking, you know, kids are going to drop these things. So we did those plastic, those plastic orange ones did a very good job of surviving. They had a high survivability rate. How many students do you usually have in a in a workshop? Um, it depends on. It, 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 15 to 30, somewhere in there. No class size, depending on the size of the class. Okay. Uh, so do you want me to put this Galileo scope back together now? Sure. But <laughs> the biggest Galileo scope builds we've done, the biggest one we've done was a, a program with Raytheon here in Tucson called Math Move You a few years ago. Okay. And uh, they, they, Raytheon in Tucson rented out the U of A student union ballrooms and invited students from all over Tucson. And uh, one day uh, we, we were shooting for 500. We just missed it, though. We had about 480 oh students build at one time wow. Galileo scopes. How many helpers did you have? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is actually part of Raytheon. They have their uh, leadership development program where they bring young engineers from around Tucson, uh, or from around the country to Tucson in the spring for a week-long training session and workshop, and this is part of that. So you had about 70, 70 to 75 two Raytheon engineers who sometimes needed more help building the scopes than the fifth graders, but um, that's another story. No, they, they were great. They were wonderful. But uh, we had so we had the students like tables of seven students with one engineer there. So had one person helping each table of seven students. And before the actual day of the build, we had a separate workshop with all the engineers where we taught all the engineers to build the scope. Mm -hmm. And then a few days later, we had the big event at the student union where all the students came and built the scope. So our record is just under 500 at once. Oh my gosh. That's, yeah. That's amazing. And, and of course we have the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association helped us out and they had you know, another dozen or so volunteers there to and then we have our undergrad students from the National Observatory here as well. So we had you know, probably probably close to, you know, probably in the nineties in terms of helpers at that event. Okay. Okay. Or that's 90, good. So, oh total. Five to one ratio. Yeah. Which isn't bad, but it's a huge event. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have some questions about the Galileo scope. Um, in terms of uh, how closely it relates to Galileo's original telescope, uh, Michael Jobin asks, "Was Galileo Galilei's was his stopped down as well?" That's a great question. Uh, are the Galileo scope that we developed is not stopped down. Uh, mm -hmm. the, that Project Star, that cardboard telescope, is just to clarify okay. that point. Um, but Galileo's uh, he had a variety of telescopes, and the goal was not to recreate Galileo's telescope with this project. The goal, because his telescope had a very small field of view, very poor optics, a lot of chromatic aberration, 
and was just overall difficult to use. So we didn't want to create a telescope difficult to use. Instead, mm -hmm. the goal was to create something about the same size, about the same diameter, and about the same magnification as Galileo's, scopes, Galileo's telescope, but with a more modern optical and mechanical design. Mm -hmm. So it was not to recreate his telescope exactly. And from what I've read about Galileo's scopes, he made a variety of scopes. He didn't just make one, of course. Right. Those, his first ones had magnification, I think, around six, I want to say. Okay. Fair, fairly low magnification, but by then he got up around 30. Ours is 25, so it's in it's upper end of that range, but in the range. And his biggest telescopes got up to around two inches, and we're at 50 millimeters, which is real, but right at two inches. So, okay. you know, so we're we're in his in that range of what he did. But it's not it's not, and of course we have a very modern Plossel eyepiece design, which uses four lenses, two two types of plastic, which Galileo didn't have, and the objective lens is a what. Did they have plastic at all? No, no, no plastic back then, believe it or not. <laughs> and the objective lens is even a doublet, and you might have it there. You can hold it. I don't know if it'll show up on the screen, but it's actually two lenses. Yep, I can see the line there. Yep. I can see the line on the lens. Two lenses glued together, so therefore it's like what made of different types of glass, with different curvatures to reduce chromatic aberration. Right. Gal Galileo's telescope couldn't even see the full moon at one time. It had less than half degree field of view. Whereas this has a one and a half degree field of view, so it's a lot of in better eye relief, for, which is nice for people wearing glasses to use it. So this is a much more modern telescope than he did, and intentionally designed that way. Now, yeah. if you want to, if you really think that's making life too easy for you, you, you might have it there, Nicole. It comes I don't with a second have it with eye me, but I know what you're talking about. It yeah, comes, it comes it. with a second eyepiece, which is a Galilean style eyepiece. Mm -hmm. The main eyepiece, the Plossel, is a converging lens style eyepiece. But Galileo used a diverging lens. So okay. we include a second eyepiece, which is a diverging lens style eyepiece. And that has a very small field of view, very poor eye relief. Um, you can't even get the full moon in there at one time. It's less than half degree field of view. So if you really want to experience what Galileo did, you can get a much better simulation of it by using that second eyepiece. And of course, that, that second eyepiece can be taken apart, then used to create a Barlow lens, which will double the magnification to 50. So we didn't include that lens just to frustrate you and show you what a lousy telescope Galileo had. But that is an added bonus. It's a great teaching opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was uh, Michael Jobin's other question: was whether Galileo had a compound uh, lens like this. So no, no this is this one with four lenses here is not like the one Galileo used. Yeah. This is the the modern nicer one. That I don't have the second eyepiece for this particular kit with me, but I had the students make it, and I had the students try it and see the difference, uh, even, at least during the day. Even our diverging lens is better than Galileo's, because Galileo used a singlet diverging lens, and ours is a doublet, so right. it's two different types of plastic, so even though it has the small field of view, it does have better color correction than he did. So how? So chromatic aberration means that the, the uh, different colors refract at different angles, so they don't quite yes. come to the same focal point. How yeah. how bad was Galileo's chromatic aberration? That, that's a great question. I'd love to look through a scope and really find out. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, but, I, but I even, saw it. Even you know, some of the inexpensive department store telescopes I've used you know, when I was a kid had pretty bad chromatic aberration. You know, so I imagine his was even worse than that. Because you, know, you, yeah. look, you look at the moon, there's this, there's this strong, bright purple ring around the moon, and it's pretty obvious something weird is going on there. So I imagine his is even worse than that. Yeah, here's the lenses pulled apart again. Here's the two. Yeah. Um, so this one is the lenses for the diverging lens. The lenses for the Galilean eyepiece are even smaller than that one. Yes, they are. <laughs> nice and small to work with. Hey, baby. Oops, flat side goes out. Yes, I still remember how this goes because <laughs> I had to help eight kids put it together. Uh. Yeah, uh, we when I was using the um, telescopes at uh, University of Virginia, we have a couple of. Um, uh, at the McCormick Observatory, we have a couple of Clark refractors. One was big, 26 inch. One was a really small, oh, yeah, six, inch, really small six inch. Had <laughs> this purple ring around everything because <laughs> yeah. it had pretty bad. I mean, it was good. It was good. It was still better than you know what Galileo had, I'm sure, because it's a 125 year old telescope, not 400 yeah. year old telescope. Uh, but it was there's a purple haze around yeah. everything. <laughs> I've never gotten to look through the. I've, got, I've looked through the Yerkes 40 inch, which is a Clark telescope, mm -hmm. and the Flagstaff 24 inch, which is another Clark. Okay. But never at the moon. So I've never got seen the moon through either of those two. Oh, it's good. I, through the 26 inch. I've never looked through the 40 inch at Yerkes, unfortunately. It's been closed or, or otherwise occupied the two times I've been there. So. Yeah, that, that's definitely a treat. Sad. Um, okay, so do we want to put this thing back together? Room, like, stop bragging, people. <laughs> yeah, right. They're like, eh, we don't care. <laughs> um, 
Uh, oh, here we go. Tom Nathan says, do a Google image search for smartphone telescope holder DIY for do-it-yourself ideas to make your own smartphone holder for telescope photography. I might do that. And actually, that that's actually brings up a fun point because uh, on the Cloudy Nights forum, back mm -hmm. when it, yeah, it's uh, run by Astronomics, it's their one of their astronomy forums, uh, when the Galileo scope came out, there was uh, actually a lengthy, very fun thread called Pimp My Galileo Scope. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually had people, all the modifications people made to Galileo scopes. And I think one of my favorites was the, uh, uh, the focus, uh, focusing mechanism someone made. Um, the regular Galileo scope, you just slide it in and out, right? Yeah. But they actually used Legos of all things. They actually used Lego and made a focusing mechanism where they actually, you know, mounted part of the Lego on the scope, another part on the focusing tube, and then had a little knob with gears where you turn it, which would slide the focusing tube in and out for you. So they, they did so a homemade Lego-based focusing mechanism for the Galileo scope. I want! So, yeah, so if you look at the Cloudy Nights forum, see if you can find that thread. It's, I believe it's called Pimp My Galileo Scope was where it was, but there's all kinds of fun things people did with Galileo scopes in there that you can look at and see all the mods they did. <laughs> to distinguish it from everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> oh... Um, I'm trying to read another question from Lily. I've got to start a donors choose project so I can start this with my earth and science students. Uh, most of them have never seen a telescope up close, much less build one. Do you have to wait till night to use them, or have you tried to use them during the day? Well, during the day, typically you can use them for um, you know terrestrial observing. Mm -hmm. uh, the Galileo scope is not designed to be a solar telescope. Um, obviously, you don't look at the sun with it. There's even a little sticker that says, "Don't look no! at the sun." Or your eyeball will burst into flames. Show them the eyeball bursting into flames part. Oh my god, that's right. I <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah, the eyeball burst into yeah. flames. So eyeball don't, don't look at the sun with them. So this is why I can't get anybody to look through a solar telescope. Like, I have a Coronado here at the department, and people are really skeptical. Because <laughs> we tell them, don't look at the sun through a telescope. I'm like, no, but this is a safe one. And they, they look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. Well, I always tell people that, that don't look through a telescope and let, at the sun unless the person you, who's telling you to look through it looks through it first themselves. There you go. That's a good one. <laughs> if they look through it first themselves and they can still see that you might have a chance. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and also, some people do solar projection, of course, where they point the telescope at the sun and then project the image of the sun on a piece of cardboard or paper behind the telescope. But that's not recommended with the Galileo scope either because the lenses get very hot. Yes. And the lenses in the Galileo scope are made of plastic. Right. And what happens to plastic when it gets hot? It, it melts. But and uh, we, we, we did test this one time. I took a Galileo scope outside and pointed at the sun. Yeah. Just to, didn't look through it. Didn't look through it. I point the sun without looking through it and yeah. waited about 10, 15 seconds. And sure enough, I start seeing smoke rising from the eyepiece. So That's it? You, 10 you seconds? Will, yeah, you have the eyepiece. Oh, my God. So don't don't look at the sun. Don't, don't even try solar don't projection because you'll melt your sun. eyepiece. Don't even point it in the sun's general direction. Don't point it in the sun's general direction. So oh. if you don't look through it, you'll still just literally destroy part of the telescope. I did, I did a solar projection thing in high school with a uh, GP department store one. Yeah, <laughs> and it no, actually, melted the glue. Let, let me grab something else here just a minute. But my Orion, uh, I have a 3-inch Orion Newtonian that I do solar projection with, and it has not ruined the telescope yet. <laughs> now, this is, this is a way you can use the Galileo scope to look at the sun. Directions for doing this are online. This was developed for the transit of Venus a few years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, uh, you, buy, you have to buy another eyepiece because it, it doesn't have plastic lenses. But, you know, you buy a cheap eyepiece for about 10 bucks or so. Surplus Shed has some cheap eyepieces for 10 to 15 bucks. And you sort of put that in there, go to your auto support store, get one of these funnels, and get a little piece of uh, movie screen fabric for the end. Yeah. And uh, then you can just insert this and into your Galileo scope and project an image of the sun on this end without damaging your Galileo scope. So, so because that, that, so it doesn't, it it doesn't damage the objective. Yeah. No, it does not damage the objective. It's the eyepiece is the problem. Yeah, the objective yeah. is glass. The, the objective is not going to melt. Right. And right. you know, it's really when you take the light that's collected by the objective and focus it down to a smaller area, that's when it gets bright and intense and dangerous. So the objective light's still all spread out, so it's fine. But this is a nice little device that they actually developed. I think on the transitofvenus.org website is what they have the directions on how to make this. And I forget what they called it, so I can't tell you what to Google. They had a special name for it, but I forget what it was. I, I just, yeah, I went to uh, Home Depot and put one of those together myself. Instead of, uh, I didn't have any fancy screen, I, I think I cut up a white t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you can do that too, but the, the, when they made this, at the, I, I made this when they were showing off the ASP meeting a few years ago. Yeah. That's Astronomical Society of the Pacific for the 
keep, 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 keep the acronyms to a minimum, right? Uh, <laughs> undefined acronyms to a minimum. We and uh, they've made these, and they, they actually bought the good movie screen. They bought a, you know, if you buy it in bulk, it's pretty cheap, but it might be difficult to get a hold of uh, for just uh, small quantities. So Yeah, as usual, I was probably putting this together the day before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it, like I said, a pinch of white t-shirt or something will do. Anything like that will do the trick as well in a pinch. Yeah, but yeah. This was, this was a very nice little device they came up with, which was a lot of fun to play with. So I have used it for solar projection with the Galileo scope just for, for demonstration purposes. And it's great because you can have a bunch of people looking at it at once. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They just, have it on a pad of paper too, but um, if you have it on the screen, everybody can kind of see it, and it's stable. It's pretty stable. Mm-hmm. There aren't really many sunspots on the sun right now. Um, there's some really pretty prominences. Does it, yeah. According in from the Coronado I used this weekend, <laughs> there were like no sunspots, but there were some nice prominences I could show. Uh, so yeah, no, I, for, I forgot about the eyeball bursting into flames. I, I should have pointed that out to the kids. I, I love that. I love that graphic on there. <laughs> I was like, look at, look at, look at the boom. <laughs> I just think that's great. Uh, we have, oh, and Lily added, um, that is awesome because some kid would use it during the day. Or some kid, I think some kid would probably try and look at the sun. So that's why the mm -hmm. sticker is very important. Um, <laughs> I was that thinking one. you can look at the moon during the day as well. You can look at the moon during the day. I have done that, yeah. You can do that. It's kind of washed out, though. Yeah, it is pretty washed out. But you can do it if it's in a pinch, it'll work. Yeah. I, I said I, I had them, you know, to test it out because it was a cloud it was cloudy. We we had them like look out the window at the trees, we had them look at the exit sign and especially the exit sign because then they could tell me is it upside down, is it right side up, is it backwards? It can, well, one, one, of, one of the other activities we'll do with the Galileo scope sometime and we're we it's very difficult to get across the idea of resolution to people, which is really the important part of a telescope. Yeah. And so one thing that we've done is we've actually gone online and uh, got some eye chart templates mm. you know, for eye charts. And we'll take the eye charts, and everyone can understand eye charts mostly. 2020 vision. Th this it. line should be able to read 20 feet away, right? Yeah. Well, with the telescope, we sort of take that and say, okay, how far away can you read this line with your Galileo scope? If you can read it at 100 feet, that means the, you have five times better vision than with your eyes. If it's 200 feet, it's you know, 10 times better vision. So we just sort of have students move the eye charts back and forth. You'd need a big field to do this because you can't see it quite a ways away, but that's another way of, you know, without going into like radians and arc seconds and all that nonsense to get across at least the idea of resolution to students on a basis which they probably have some experience with. Even fairly young students have seen an eye chart. Yes, yes. Of course, we, all, we sometimes also use the advantage of our modern computers and printer to print the eye chart upside down and backwards so that when you look at that through the telescope, okay. it's correct. Nice. You know, so they actually see the letters as they should appear rather than uh, upside down and backwards, which does make it a little easier to read. Well, some of the eye charts... They, some of the archers I've seen, they have the E, and yeah. then they just turn the E in all different directions. You have to tell, tell them which direction it's pointing. Yeah. I was always in that case, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, then it doesn't really matter. For me, I can, I can report that the big E is blurry without my contacts. That's about what I can do, too. <laughs> <laughs> so sad. And yet you're an optical. I, I went to radio. I blame, I blame that partly on the, the bad eyes. Yeah. I've, I've done radio. I've, I've worked at Green Bank too, so. That's true. That's true. Yeah, Green Bank. My, my goal, my goal is throughout my career to complete the entire EM spectrum. I'll oh, see. I started at high frequency radio and just went to lower and lower frequencies. <laughs> this went the wrong way. Oh, so I'm going to put this thing back together. Um, so there are instructions that come with your Galileo scope to help you put it back together. I've never used them. <laughs> personally, because I think the first time I was handed a Galileo scope to put together for an outreach event, we had, you know, the sun was setting, and we had, like, ten minutes, and we had, you know, four grad students were like, all right, we don't need instructions, we'll just do it. And we managed to get it together. Um, but uh, there are instructions that come in the packet. Um, are those the original? Because I remember there were some complaints about the original oh, instructions. Oh, God, don't. <laughs> is there, is it still... no, those are not the original instructions. <laughs> those are not the original instructions. Okay, okay. If, if, if for some reason you find a Galileo scope that has just one page of instructions... Printed front and back, throw those away. They're all, they're worth they're awful. Or uh, save it for. Hilarious. I'm not going to go into the sordid story of those, but uh, <laughs> that was just for the first run of Galileo scopes. Those were in there, and um, okay. the, literally that part of it was because they told us you only had one page. But after the second run, they said we'll give you five pages. So the five page version is much better. Yeah, because the one we used with the students two weeks ago was fine. It was. Yeah, it was yeah. Fine. Like so the, the, but there's only that first run, which hopefully those are all gone by now. That's probably the one I have, but I, I probably didn't save the box because yeah. it's me. Yeah. <laughs> so which way, since I took it out without looking, which uh, which mm -hmm. lens goes towards the outside? The thick one? The, the, thin, the thin lens goes toward the front of the tube and the thick toward the back of the tube. So the, the okay. thin lens toward the 
uh, object you're looking at and the thick one toward the eyepiece. Ta-da! Ta-da, yep. And I took, I didn't, like I said, I didn't take the eyepiece apart, but you do have to put the four lenses in here mm-hmm. and the field stop, which it ended up in the other half. Yeah, be very careful when you're unpacking this because you, <laughs> you won't notice this piece. Yeah, we sometimes that little piece falls eight. down. Hmm? That little piece will fall down in the box. Yeah. Yeah, we, we missed it in eight kits. We, we recovered them all from the recycling, but <laughs> we had to dig through the recycling. So this is kind of cheating because this does this is probably takes the longest to get them all in there um, in the eyepiece. So what, um, so what um, activities have you done recently with the Galileo scope? Well, what, we did another Math Moves You with Raytheon this year. They've, they've, they've scaled back slightly from the 500 students. This year only did about 200. So oh, only, 200 200. only 200. Only 200 at a time. Um, nice. But our next, our next big, uh, we've been working with the Science Foundation Arizona a lot recently on the uh, their Galileo scope program, and their goal is to bring Galileo scopes to schools around the state. Okay. And typically, what we'll do there, they, they, they focus on what they call rural Arizona. Mm-hmm. Now, in Arizona, rural means not Tucson and not Phoenix. Okay. So. <laughs> So that's a lot of area to cover, so to speak. A lot of Arizona. Well, well typically, do, we're going to be doing Marana this year in Flagstaff, I believe. When we'll be going up there and do, we'll literally do a teacher professional development workshop, an all-day professional development workshop, where we go through a lot of the activities from the kit, how to build a Galileo scope, and then the teachers get a, a Galileo scope optics kit, which has some of the lenses and lights and lasers and all that stuff in it. It comes in a nice little bag. We call it teaching with telescopes. We have these teaching oh, with telescopes. Go. We get a duffel bag with all the equipment they can take back to their classroom to do these activities. And they also get a, a, you know, a set of Galileo scopes, you know, roughly, you know, depending on the size of the class, roughly, you know, 10 Galileo scopes or so um, mm-hmm. to take back, and tripods to take back to their class. They go through the act- optics activities, they build them with the t- students. Then we end up doing what, a district-wide star party with them. So we'll go up there and we'll actually, before the star party, we even visit all their classrooms. So we'll have an NOAO representative, me or one of my students, or uh, Steve Pompey will come and visit their classroom, make sure all the Galileo sculpts are assembled correctly, get them ready for the star party, then have a big star party. Um, and we've done this in, in Yuma, in Safford, and uh, Globe, and Payson. And uh, we did one in Flagstaff a few years ago, too. And these star, and we, these star parties will sometimes attract five, 600 people at a, right. for a star party as well. With the, we usually focus on the fifth or sixth grade students in the district cool. and their families. So I love that this comes together with these these these. They're not really rubber bands. They're more like O-rings. They're O-rings. Yeah, yeah. they're little yeah. rings That's what makes it easy to take apart and put together. So here's the focuser tube. And I found out that they last about four years in Tucson before they dry out. Oh, wow. <laughs> but for, for, fortunately, they're standard size O-rings, so you can get them at Ace Hardware for $0.10 cents a piece or so. So nice. every four <laughs> years, you're going to have about $0.25 cents worth of maintenance cost on your Galileo scope. <laughs> oh, noes. So, yeah, that goes in here. Yeah, right? deal breaker there, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> Maintenance, burr. Oh, can't forget the nut because that's how you can put it on your uh, your tripod. Standard quarter twenty. I hope I'm putting this together right. <laughs> so I've got focuser tube, objective. That looks good. Looks good. Nut. Do I have now the use? The use. You vents are on the outside. Yeah, they go out on that end. So you're correct there too. Yep. Okay. I think uh, Pamela has one she painted bronze for a steampunk astronomer costume. Ooh, cool. So, so <laughs> you really can uh, go to town decorating these. Now, That's getting these a... O-rings around is a little futzy sometimes. Yeah, we don't, we don't recommend dropping it too often, but I have dropped mine repeatedly and it still survives, so <laughs> um, just because I've had it for so long. The telescope itself survives the drop test. And I don't even put out on those external O-rings all the time myself. I sometimes oh, really? leave those off just so it's easier to take apart because I take mine apart so often. This isn't even mine. I should put it back together. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the STEM Center ones. Yeah, there and was the a bit of I, I, I find this one must have come apart several times because this one's pretty easy to do, but the, the brand new ones we opened with the students were a little tough to get over. Oh. But it could also be the tiny fingers. Yeah. Tiny middle schooler fingers. Yeah, sometimes for students, at least let them do that part in partners. So one person holds the scope, while the other person does the O ring. I think I put this. Let them help out a little, help each other out a little bit. Where's this back piece go? Oh, that was supposed to go on first, wasn't it? And just in case you're wondering, you can actually take off the uh, um, 
the what you haven't put on yet, the uh, the big stray light shade at the front of it, no, the yeah. front one. If that's not on, it'll fit in a standard airline carry-on. Really? Just take that off. Yeah. So, <laughs> and uh, just, so, just in case you're curious, TSA does not stop you for carrying a Galileo scope through security. So trust me on that. Well, it doesn't set off the metal detectors. No, nope, no metal detectors, and but they don't even give you funny looks at the X-ray. You know, the X-ray machine they don't give you funny looks. That's funny. Which you know, sometimes when you carry something unusual shaped through there, they'll look at you just to see what it is. Yes. Well, when we carry bags full of we have little Cosmo Quest pins, mm -hmm. those because they that's all metal, and then they're yeah. like, "What the heck?" And then you can explain what Cosmo Quest is, and they're like, "Okay, move along." Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes people see things they don't know what it is, and you know, we we, we if, you, if you have a if you have a Dobsonian telescope, there's a and you set up in your yard, there's there's a, there's at least a small but non-zero chance that the um. Your neighbors have called the cops on you for setting up mortar launchers or something. Oh, shoot, that would look like that. Yeah, that happened to me once. So really? I had a had a nice chat with the police who thought I was going to launch because I was called reported for launching mortars from my front yard or something oh my God. by a neighbor who didn't know, didn't know what it was. People did ask me, "What am I spying on?" I brought a telescope to the custard stand for an event, and I'm like, "I what? No, we're looking at the planets." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so put the eyepiece on. Um, so uh, there's also a link in the comments now to a Lego focuser for the Galileo scope from. Oh Omaha. yeah, we found it. <laughs> so thank you, Tom. Tom's good. <laughs> Tom's good with the link. Um, so check that out. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna post it on the video screen because that'll make it go away in the comments. So you can check that out there. Um, because yeah, some <clears throat> I think with again with with the little hands, they have trouble getting the focus right. Mm -hmm. And I try and teach them to just. I mean, even though you don't have to twist it, I find it easier when I twist it. Yeah, I and twist it too. It, it moves a bit more smoothly. So finding the focus, but we, we managed to get them out there the next night. Not not the uh, the night we build them, but the next night. And uh, we gave them tri so for the cost of the camp, they got a Galileo scope and a tripod, and uh, we're able to get Jupiter before it set, and I think Saturn as well. A whole lot of them, and their parents came, and they were just like, "This is so cool!" So but I will say that for, really even it's only a two-inch telescope from a dark site, if you have a really, really dark site, the first mm -hmm. time I did this was Bryce Canyon National Park, so we're talking dark. Yeah. Uh, if you can look at Andromeda through the Galileo scope, it's mm -hmm. a very pleasing sight because the Galileo scope has a bigger field of view than most yeah. telescopes. Yeah. So you actually see more of the galaxy at once, and it's actually very pleasing through there. I was actually pleasantly surprised how good Andromeda was. I mean, I've seen looked at Andromeda through six-inch scopes and didn't see as much through the Galileo scope. Right. Not because the Galileo scope is that much, you know, bigger or anything. It obviously collects less light, but the six-inch telescope might have a field of view like yay, so you just see the central core. Yeah. Galileo scope has a field like yay, so you see the, uh, you know, the some more of the disc and arm, the, the, more of the disc. I don't think so I've actually much... done that. I haven't, I haven't actually tried that yet. Yeah. Like I said, get a dark sight. Cause it has to be a fairly dark sight because okay. to see it extend out there. Otherwise, you'll just get the core. But from a dark sight, Andromeda is pretty impressive. Cool. So Andromeda, Jupiter, Saturn. What Jupiter, else? Jupiter, Saturn. Pleiades are great too. Same thing with the Pleiades. The Pleiades are a big object, so they actually see more of it through the Galileo scope than you would with a bigger telescope in a small field of view. The Beehive is a great one too, another good one. That's so up now. The, yeah. the Galileo scope really excels on big objects. Mm -hmm. I think it's M7, the globular cluster off the tail of Scorpius, if I remember correctly, is another very good one through there. You may be a bit further south than me. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a little farther <laughs> south. That's yeah. on the horizon for me. Yeah. Or in the glow of the oil refinery from from our campus site, sadly. There's a lot of great objects through there. Orion Nebula is, of course, great through there. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. I've actually, I've actually even, uh, from, again, from a dark side, I've actually gotten, uh, let's see, Titan, Saturn's moon. Most, you can always get Titan. Titan's pretty easy to get with the Galileo scope, Saturn's moon, Titan. But I've also gotten, uh, from a very dark site, I can't remember which ones were they. I want to say Dione and Tethys. Really? I actually, I actually verified it with the with an app to be sure that I was looking at that. I was like, I'm seeing two things here. I wonder if those are actually moons. If they're just weird, weird stray stars. I called up my app. I'm like, wow, I think I'm getting those two moons there. I'm curious. So, what app do you use for Saturn? Because I have a really good Jupiter one. I don't have a Saturn yeah. one. Oh, I think it's I think it's actually a, a there's um oh god I have to look it up. It's not actually an app. There's a web page that maps them every night. You just go to the web page. I think it's the University of Washington web page that map has the a map of Saturn's moons. I just Google Saturn Moon's position. This web page comes up, and it gives me a nice map of them every time. So cool. What's it? It's bookmarked in my cell phone, but I can't remember the web the the, the link. So we have a few more comments. Um, let's see, the scope looks a lot nicer than my 50x Tasco. 
Michael Jobin. I had a Tasco pair. That's good. Really, I, 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 I had a, ta I have a Tasco pair of binoculars that I want to replace. <laughs> Mine was little and red and had tiny little tripod feet, and I could see the moon from New York, and that was it. <laughs> um, and Dancy said she was able to use her cell phone camera uh, to take a handheld photograph through a per periscope eyepiece this weekend. It was tricky, but managed to get something. Interesting. I uh, <clears throat> didn't have anybody show up for the summer star party. The I get lots of students during the fall and spring from the local high schools and the college. Mm -hmm. but with classes out, there weren't as many people, so I was like, I'm going to take some vines of Saturn through the 8-inch, and I just put the phone up against, had to find, you know, because the cover's slightly weird. I had to, mm -hmm. like, find the right angle to get it on, and I took some little vines of Saturn <laughs> through, the, yeah. uh, through the telescope. Uh, Michael Jobin loves his 40-millimeter plossel. Lots of plossel love here. Yeah, that's another thing we should mention is it is a one and a quarter inch eyepiece, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have other eyepieces, you can slide them in there. That's standard size, yeah. Yeah, that's standard size. So a lot of lot of people have other eyepieces. If you want to use a different eyepiece in Galileo, go go for it. Try experiment. How long does it, like stick in here so that it doesn't fall out? Uh, as as long as it's just a standard eyepiece, like plossels are fine. You know, if you have like a big big negler or something that's very heavy, it's just friction, so it might fall out. I wouldn't use anything too expensive or heavy, but Right. Standard plossels and Kellners and that sort of thing. I've I've used lots of them and they never had a problem with them falling and that's out. That's part of what these little use are for, right? That's to yeah. kind of mm -hmm. slope mm -hmm. inside a bit so it grips better. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Guido says uh, Galileo scopes with Con Cosmo Quest branding. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I probably have stickers I could stick all over mine. Um, and there's another well, link from do, Tom. Hmm? We do the math moves. You event Raytheon has st their own stickers. They make the students put on the Galileo scopes. <laughs> Of course, of course. So they do their branding, so it's it's, it's done. Sure. My, I think mine is covered in little colorful stars. My, mine at home is covered in little colorful star stickers to uh, distinguish it from everybody else's at the star party. Because <laughs> I'm a dork. Uh, Tom Nathy has a link to 10-Minute Astronomy has some expensive Galileo scope modifications. Wow, that sounds interesting. Curious what this is. Yeah. I'm going to open that up. Um, let's see. I can screen share that. Ultimate Galileo Scope Quest. This is a multi-part post. Oh my god. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Two inch fo yes, that is a two inch focuser on David's Galileo Scope. Why do you ask? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So that's a, a multi-part post that you can dig into if you really want to trick out your Galileo scope um, with some, a guy, it looks like finder scope and, <laughs> what is that? Can you see what that is, what I'm pointing yeah, at? That's some, so probably something he just put in there to make sure it came to focus with his eyepiece, so it's probably just an extender of some type, but I can't tell for sure. Funny. Awesome, awesome. So I some, some that's the problem with using a diagonal with it is you need to, uh, getting it to come to focus with the diagonal can be yeah. problematic. But it looks like he, that's probably part of his solution to that problem. Okay. Now, well, one, one thing that they really used to have, I don't know if they still do, but it, I think, it, I think people found them at Walmart several years ago in the gun department of all places. They found these little, like, you know, for BB guns, these little red dot find, these little red yeah. dot sights you put on the top of BB gun, and some people put, start mounting those on Galileo scopes for finder scopes. Oh, okay. Well, they make them for telescopes as well. I don't know yeah. if they sell them separately yeah. from the telescope, though. Well, the one, the, the, these were like little ones. They're about 10 bucks. They're cheaper than the ones for telescopes. They just came like little, um, uh, like stickers on the bottom. So you yeah. sort of peel them off, and it's stick it on there. So they're, they're, very, they're very cheap ones designed for, like, BB guns, you know, for very, very cheap things. But, yeah, you can, you can buy, of course, the good Orion or... Uh, Orion what makes the red dot finders for about 50 bucks or so. Okay. We could go really nuts and put a Telrad on there. <laughs> go, go to town. Just use a little the, overkill, but hey. This is your canvas, people. <laughs> you can get really creative. Oh, that's fun. So I will definitely put all these links in the show notes. So if you're listening to the podcast, we'll put all these links in the show notes. I will include them in the description of the events as well. So those of you watching live or those of you watching on YouTube later, they'll show up in the description. So you can check out all these fantastic links. And thank you, Tom, for sharing all of these. Awesome yeah, th videos. thanks to our Google master there. <laughs> yeah. Da, da, oh, you need stuff. Da, 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 boom. <laughs> Resources. Awesome. Okay, so we are kind of closing in on an hour, so I want to do some 
quick announcements, and then we can uh, maybe do some last uh, burst of resources or places people can find stuff. Um, <clears throat> the let's see the Weekly Space Hangout is this Friday, and I think if I read the description correct, uh, they're going on hi summer hiatus after this. This is the last one until after Dragon Con, uh, so they'll be taking July and August off for the Weekly Space Hangout. Mm, sorry, um, we'll have to figure out what to, something to do in the interim. Uh, so, so check out the last Weekly Space Hangout on, um, of the summer uh, this Friday at noon Pacific. Uh, on probably from Fraser Kane's uh, Google Plus page, and it'll be on Universe Today, it'll be on CosmoQuest. Uh, the Virtual Star Party is also moving to its monthly format. Uh, I still need... Uh, Tom, I know you're a Virtual Star Party astronomer if you have the, the date. I don't know when the, the next date is going to be, but they're moving VSP to a monthly format uh, in part because of uh, all the weather problems they've been having with all their astronomers, weather and scheduling. So they will have a show every month come clouds or rain or storms or whatnot, because they'll be building up pictures over the month, but then they'll do live observing if uh, if it's available. And then, um, uh, I think depending on travel, I know uh, they've been posting some Astronomy Cast episodes as well, so go to the Astronomy Cast Google Plus page to see the upcoming schedule of that. That's usually uh, Monday at noon Pacific as well. Uh, and that brings us back around to Learning Space next Wednesday. We have Libby Norcross from the Challenger Center. I'm really excited. Oh, um, my good friend Libby. Yeah, I have. I don't think I've met her in person, but I follow her on all the, the medias, and so I'm really excited to, to talk to her. Yeah, she, I met her at the uh, Mars Curiosity launch tweet up several years ago. Cool. And uh, she actually became one of our Galileo Educator Network fellows last year, so she, I've, I've, I've worked with her in multiple multiple capacities over the years. Excellent, cool. So she'll be on next Wednesday. Um, so that is our schedule roundup. Maybe, uh, Rob, do you have um, maybe some suggested resources for people or places they can find your work? Well, there's GalileoScope.org, of course, which has the Galileo Scope stuff. There's also TeachingWithTelescopes.org, which mm -hmm. is our other website, which we uh, have Galileo Scope information on. So those would be the, two, but the first two places I'd recommend off the top of my head. Okay, sounds and good. And of course, I mentioned some other ones throughout here, like the, cl the Cloudy Night stuff, which has been posted as well, so those are always fun. Cloudy Night. I'll definitely add that. Cloudy Nights, go to the Cloudy Night Forum. No. Oh, I just got a 404. Never mind. Didn't I can't remember what the... It might be is it cloudynights.com or no. Cloudynights.com. Yeah, I think I went to the old one first. So cloudynights.com will take you to that forum as well, so... Yeah. Awesome. I will be sharing, <clears throat> I said I'll be sharing all these links. I love the font you guys have on t the Teaching with Telescopes. Yeah, it is a nice font. I like that too. We have good, we have good graphic designers here. It's a, it's a little Twilight Zoning. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. All right. Thank you so, so much, Rob. Thank you, everybody, for uh, watching, participating, listening, uh, and we'll see you next week on Learning Space. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. Bye. Bye.